With so many offences involving a public place, such as the possession of a bladed or pointed article, many of you have quite rightly asked the question of what is the legal definition of a public place. As usual, there's a short answer and a long answer. For the short answer, we can look to the Criminal Justice Act 1972, Section 33, which reads as follows. Public place includes any highway and any other premises or place to which, at the material time, the public have or are permitted to have access, whether on payment or otherwise. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Essentially anywhere that the public have access or are permitted access, whether on payment or otherwise. But what about a football stadium? What about the football pitch? How about the communal area of a block of flats? How about a pub car park? How about a pub car park when it's closed and locked off? Or when it's closed and not locked off? These are the questions I'm looking at today. But first of all, if you're new here, smash that subscribe button if you've got questions of your own because I help you understand law. So for those of you that have followed my channel for a while by now, you will know that legislation codifies law for courts to follow when they are presented with a given set of facts. But as always, it's not that simple. The court needs to look at the law, look at the set of facts, try to determine what Parliament meant when they created this law. Often there are guidance notes within Parliament or even look into Hansard, which is a record of what was said in Parliament. Then they look at the set of facts and try to decide whether those set of facts apply in the way that the law was intended. So as I said, lots of offences relate to a public place. In fact, lots of offences can only be committed in a public place. So when looking at the law and the set of facts, it's absolutely crucial that the decision is made by the court as to whether or not the location of this specific incident is a public place. So by way of example, let's look at the landing area of a block of flats. In the case of Knox and Anderson in 1982, the court was asked to look at the upper landing area of a block of flats to which the public had unhindered access. The court decided that this could amount to a public place. However, contrasting this in the case of Williams and the Director of Public Prosecutions 10 years later, the court addressed the same issue only this time the access to that upper landing area was controlled. Therefore, the court held that this was not a public place. Now, you might think that the locked door, a buzzer or some other kind of restriction was the deciding factor between the two cases. However, that wasn't quite it. The deciding factor was that in the original case, members of the public were known to use that landing way as a bit of a shortcut through shopping centres and so on. It was because the public used this that it was deemed to be a public place. There was a similar discussion in Harriet and DPP of 2005 involving the resident of a hostel and the forecourt area between the hostel and the road. In this case, the High Court held that unimpeded access to a particular place by itself did not turn it into a public place. Confused? This is why it's never a yes-no question to a legal query. One final case involving the landing in a block of flats was in 1980. The defendant was charged with having an offensive weapon in a public place, but the landing was shared between him and another flat, so it was held that it was not a public place and he was not in contravention of that act. The takeaway from all of these cases is that it is a question of fact as to whether the general public have unimpeded access to a particular place. Not just whether the public have access or whether they just have unimpeded access, but whether the general public do generally have unimpeded access. Make sense? Of course. So in conclusion, it's unlikely that the communal area of a block of flats is going to be considered a public place. But as you can see, it always depends on the facts. Moving on to the case of Corley and Frost of 1976. This involved a football stadium and a speedway track, and whether either of those amount to a public place. It seems obvious enough that the actual seating area of a football stadium is a public place because the public have access upon payment, but the public did not have general permission to be on the football pitch or on the speedway track. So the question for the court is whether either of those amounted to a public place. In the case, at the end of the football match, the defendant and others climbed over the fence onto the speedway track and were hurling abuse at each other. The defendant was convicted for using threatening behaviour in a public place under the Public Order Act, but he appealed to the Crown Court on the basis that the speedway track was not a public place. The Crown Court upheld his appeal, but then the prosecutor appealed again to the Queen's Bench Division. This time, the court held that the overall premises should be considered as one, and therefore the speedway track was a public place. On the basis that where the public had access to the premises, the premises should be considered as a whole. 
including the Speedway track. Moving on to a case of Crown against Kane, which involved a club. Essentially, this was a private club, so ordinarily a private club would not be a public place because members of the public are not permitted to enter this private club. But in the case, there was evidence that members of the public would come up to the club, never having been there before, didn't know the bouncer, didn't know the proprietor, but they were allowed in anyway. This was evidence that general members of the public were being given access to the club and thus determined it as a public place. Crown Against Waters of 1963 involved the car park to a hotel. Of course, if you watch my other video, you'll know that certain offences are committed if you are unfit to drive through drink in a public place. The question for the court was whether this car park was a public place. At the time in question, the car park was in fact closed and the judge withdrew the question from the jury as to whether or not this was a public place. Once again, this was appealed to the Court of Criminal Appeal as to whether or not it was in fact a public place, because after all, it was closed. The court held that it's always a matter of fact and degree, and whilst the car park was closed at that particular time, there was no barrier and there was nothing to prevent general members of the public entering the car park as they would otherwise ordinarily do and thus it is always a question of fact and degree as to whether or not it's a public place. As an aside to the car park in Elkins and Cartledge, it was decided that an enclosure to which people were invited to go was also a public place. In another case, a defendant was standing in his rear garden yelling abuse at somebody else across the fence. At court, the justices were of the view that his shouting caused a disturbance which could be heard well across the fence into a public place. Now, whilst he was only bound over to keep the peace, the divisional court said the justices were wrong to say he was in breach of the Public Order Act because he was in his rear garden, which was not a public place. So that was your rear garden, but how about your front garden? Because you might think that members of the public have access across your front garden to knock your front door. This was exactly the question before the court in 1978, which decided that just because members of the public have access across your front garden to your front door, does not make your front garden a public place. In 1976, the court had to address the question as to whether a firearm kept behind the counter in a shop amounted to a public place for the purposes of the Firearms Act 1968. On appeal, the court held that the room housing the shop was properly considered to be one unit, thus the whole place was a public place, including the counter. So hopefully this is an interesting illustration of how case law interacts with legislation and definitions, and how every case turns on its own facts. It is never a yes, no question. Even if there is a definition written into law, there is always an interpretation of that law by the courts, which can and very often is corrected and appealed, redefined, and will continue to be clarified through subsequent case law. And sometimes the whole lot can be turned upside down. For example, if a case finds its way all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court disagrees with decisions of the lower courts. In the meantime, don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.